Hello, I'm David Rockwell, and welcome to CSKT's Tribal PIR Day session uh, on Explore the River Interactive Modules. Thank you for tuning in. Over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to look at several Tribal Education Department online resources that include Fire on the Land, Explore the River, and the Lower Flathead River Interactive Map. Then we'll focus in on four of the interactive modules from Explore the River, three of which are on building traditional fishing tools, a fish spear, a fish trap, and a fishing hook, and one of which is on restoring a river virtually. So let's get started. Fire on the Land, Explore the River, and the Flathead River interactive map were put together in the early and mid-2000s. They were built as interactive DVDs using Flash, but since then, Flash has pretty much gone away, and many computers now uh, don't come with DVD players. So the tribes are converting these Flash-based DVDs to web-based resources. We are rewriting the Flash code, which was ActionScript, to HTML and JavaScript. The full conversion of the Flash DVD should be completed sometime early next year, at which point anyone with an internet connection will be able to access all of the material, all of the resources on all three DVDs. These web-based resources will also be fully responsive, meaning they'll work on uh, smartphones, iPads and other tablets, and desktop computers. Before we get into the interactive modules, let's take a quick look at all three of these resources, Fire on the Land, Explore the River, and the interactive uh, Flathead River map. The Fire on the Land project, published in 2006, focused on the traditional and current use of fire by the Salish and Pondere people and the effects that Indian burning had on plant and animal communities in the Northern Rockies. Funded by the National Interagency Fire Center, it includes an interactive multimedia DVD, a short film also on a DVD, a storybook published by the University of Nebraska Press, and a comprehensive curriculum and study guide. The package won the 2005 National Fire Plan Award for Excellence in Community Assistance, the National Fire Managers Award, and the book, Beaver Stills Fire, won the 2006 American Indian Youth Literature Award. The package has been widely acclaimed by educators as one of the highest quality sets of fire education and Indian education materials available. It's also been used by the National Park Service specifically Glacier National Park, and Region 1 of the U.S. Forest Service. Some of you may be familiar with what's on the interactive DVD and the other components of the Fire on the Land project, but for those who aren't, I'd like to take just a few minutes and give an overview of each part so you know exactly what will be uh, coming available online early next year. To do this, I'm going to have to use the uh, the DVD flash version of Fire on the Land because the online version isn't ready yet. So here's the introductory page on the flash based DVD. Uh, this is going to look a little bit different when we uh, finish the conversion to the web. It'll be much more modern looking uh, and have updated information as well. So on this page, you can see there's information about the project itself and about the DVD. There are resources available so you can extend uh, materials beyond what's on the DVD, uh, articles, uh, books, and so forth, web links, bibliographies, fire education materials, and so forth. The next tab on the, um, on the DVD is the coyote story. This is the beaver steals fire story. And it's on the DVD. It also was published as a book when the project first came out. And the options here are you can listen to the uh, Beaver Steals Fire story uh, in both Salish or in English. You can read the story 
uh, there's information on the artist, and there's a great article on the relevance of the story to today's educators and students. Uh, so let's just look at the um, at the listen tab, and you can see here this holds true for the uh, hard copy of the book as well as the DVD. Uh, we ask that uh, the story not be told or read uh, unless there's snow on the ground, unless it's winter. And that's part of an oral tradition that stretches back many thousands of years. And in fact, on the web version, uh, the story will likely be timed to only be available in the winter months. And so we can uh, flip through the book just like it was a real book. Um, and then we can listen either in Salish or in English. So let's just start listening to Tony Inkashola read the story in English. Excuse me, in Salish. So you can see you can also read the story in Salish so you can read along with Tony as he, he reads the story. The next tab on the DVD includes a number of interviews and these are quite extensive. I don't know how many hours altogether of interviews there are, but there's quite a bit of uh, material here. So we have interviews with Tony Inkashola, Harriet Whitworth, and Felicity McDonald, with Mike Durgalo Sr., Louis Adams, and Enius Vanderberg. We also have fire manager interviews with Tony Harwood, Ron Sweeney, and Bob McCrae. The next tab on the DVD is a photo gallery that includes then and now photos, which I'll come back and show you in a second, fire types uh, gallery, so it includes photos of, of lethal and non-lethal birds, different kinds of fires, and includes landscape photos of the aftermaths of fires and how lethal burns affect landscapes and how non-lethal burns affect landscapes visually. And then finally we have a fire management gallery which has a number of uh, images of prescribed burning and fighting fires and so forth. So let's look quickly at the uh, Then and Now gallery. And you can see here that uh, there were a number of photos that we collected from the late 1800s, early 1900s that showed the landscape at that time and the, the fire patterns, the old bird burn patterns on the mountains. We revisited those sites and took pic pictures uh, in the early 2000s. And so it's really interesting, and I'm sure it would be interesting for your students to go through and look at these landscapes that they're familiar with and think about how fire shaped those landscapes, how they looked when fire was natural part of the landscape, and how they look today after a century, more than a century of fire exclusion and fire suppression. And so there's a fire types landscape where we talk show pictures of lethal or stand replacement fires and pictures of non-lethal fires. We have a similar thing for the landscape and we have a fire management gallery as well. There's a section on fire ecology. And so here uh, students can learn about different concepts such as forest succession, disturbances, which are very important to our forests and healthy forests. They can learn about the fire triangle and about uh, various terms that fire managers and scientists use. They can also learn about and study fire regimes, the non-lethal fire regime, mixed mid-elevation fire regime, the lethal fire regime, and the mixed high elevation regime. They can look at where these occur on the landscape. So we can look at the non-lethal regime, can look at fire maintained grasslands where they occur, uh, mixed fire regime at mid elevations, and the lethal regime. And then to make this somewhat abstract concept more concrete, they can actually look at where these uh, regimes occur in the Mission Mountains, for example. We have a section on the fire effects of plants. 
on plants. Uh, for example, you can look at the fire effects on various tree species uh, found in our region. You can look at the effects on, uh, let's see, shrubs, forbs, and grasses. And you can do the same for animals. So it's quite a bit of information uh, if someone is interested in studying or doing a report on how fires, fire affects different species in our forests. There's also an extensive section, in fact this is one of the most extensive uh, and well-researched sections on the DVD uh, on the history and culture of the tribes and fire. So there's a section on traditional culture, traditional way of life, why and how fire was used, and a cultural geography which includes fire related place names. So each of these buttons includes much more information. So for example, uh, we, we are looking at traditional culture here and we learn about the person whose responsibility was to set fires uh, in pre-settlement uh, times. We can look at reasons for burning. And so uh, there are a number of, of reasons listed here, brush, beauty, cleaning, trails, berries, hunting, horses, and signaling. The next part of the history section, culture section, includes the great changes, the arrival of the horse, diseases, and firearms, and the impact that those changes had on the traditional use of fire by the tribes. They used fires to manage forests, and that was disrupted by these various impacts of uh, European settlement. And there's a section on the 19th century and the 20th and 21st centuries, including climate change. So you can see there's quite a bit of material there uh, that your students might uh, enjoy or appreciate. Finally, the last section of the DVD includes fire management today, the tribe's fire management plan, prescribed burns, wildfires, fire occurrence. So for example, here you can look at all the fires where they occurred between 1980 and 1989, where they occurred between 1990 and 1999, and, um, and look at all of the fires between 1980 and 2003. Section on lookouts and the tools of the trade uh, and how you use those tools. You can look at specific uh, fire lookouts and learn a little bit about their history. So that's an overview of the uh, interactive DVD portion of the Fire on the Land project. Next we'll look at the curriculum which is specific to this interactive DVD and includes uh, various lesson plans that you can use. The curriculum is in uh, PDF form and it will be included on the website with the other uh, with the rest of the Fire on the Land materials and it covers much of what we looked at in the, um, the these lessons cover much of what we looked at uh, on the interactive DVD. So there are there's a lesson plan for the storybook, Beaver Steals Fire. There are a couple lesson plans for the elder interviews. There are lesson plans for the photo galleries, um, for the uh, plant and animal species that are adapted to fire. There's, uh, there are lesson plans on fire science, fire behavior, and so forth. And we'll take a quick look at one of these. Let's take the first one, Beaver Steals Fire. Um, I just want to show you how detailed these are. So I won't read through these headings or anything, but I'll just uh, scroll through here and you can get an idea of, of um, how much is packed into each of these lesson plans.
So that's all that I have to say at this point about the, uh, the curriculum for Fire on the Land. And again, it will be included on the website along with the uh, other interactive multimedia materials. Okay, so let's look at the Lower Flathead River uh, interactive map next. Again, we're going to have to look at the interactive DVD version because the web version is under construction. In the web version, we'll be replacing this DVD version, but the content will be the same. The, uh, the interactive river map was created for teachers and students that are participating in the river honoring, but it also has value for science teachers in middle schools and in high schools. This is the welcome page, the home page of the, of the DVD. On the DVD, there are two welcome videos. These are by Tony Incasola of the Salish Pondre Culture Committee, and the other one is by Vernon Finley of the Kootenai Culture Committee. These, um, these welcome videos do a lot more than just welcome the students to the river. They're beautiful, heartfelt essays about the river and its place in Tony and Vernon's lives and also in our lives. And because they're thoughtful and thought-provoking, they will add a great deal of depth to your students' appreciation of the river and its natural history. So I strongly encourage you to take the time to watch them with your students. The interactive map will come back to. Um, there are some movies on this DVD and will be on the website. Uh, three movies, all three about the Lower Flathead River. There's The Place of Falling Waters, the river is wider than it seems, and the river lives. Um, the river is wider than it seems was filmed in the 1970s, so it's an older film and it's deteriorated somewhat, but it's still well worth watching. It's about the dams that were proposed to be built on the river by the Ar Army Corps of, en Corps of Engineers. There's a resources section on the DVD, it includes a plant guide, and the plant guide uh, con contains or includes trees and shrubs found along the river. So any of the trees or shrubs that you might see if you're hiking or, or uh, taking a field trip to the river uh, will, will be in this little field guide. There's also a, a track guide, and it's uh, mammals. Uh, it's a mammal guide, a guide to mammal tracks that you might see along the river. Now, both the plant guide and the track guide include uh, the Salish name for the animal or plant and the Kootenai name for the animal or plant. There are also lesson plans. Uh, I think there are seven or eight lesson plans here. And there is a career guide for students interested in careers in natural resources. Let's go back to the interactive map and look at how that works. Um, the, the map um, includes a, a number of different topics from geology and hydrology to biology, everything from canyon wrens to West Slope cutthroat trout. It also includes a lot of history from the history of Kerr Dam to the Pablo Allard buffalo herd that used to roam the river corridor. And it uses photos, videos, uh, charts, essays, articles, uh, so that students can learn all about the river corridor in preparation for the annual river honoring. The way it works is you can either drag the map like this, click and drag, or you can go up here to this little locator map in the upper right hand corner and click on a location on the river and go directly there. So if we want to go to the Moise area, we can just click on that on the locator map. When you get to where you want to be on a river, you can click on one of these icons for information. So this particular one happens to be wetlands and the river. Uh, this, this icon represents animals. And this particular one happens to be about the trumpeter swans that were planted on the river. Some of these are uh, just brief little uh, passages about uh, that part of the river. This shows the geology 
what's beneath the river and its floodplain. Uh, also, uh, these, these plant icons represent different plant species you'll see along the river. Some of them, uh, like these, which are um, spaced out periodically on the river, you can actually look at the composition of the vegetation that borders the river. Well, a lot of these are, are brief uh, descriptions. If we go up here to uh, Big Bend, see that some of them have much more extensive information. This shows a series of pictures of the bison along the river. And then we have a documentary film with Charlie McDonald, whose father and brother worked on rounding up the bison uh, in the early 1900s, him talking about that event. And we have Charlie and, and other people talking about the history of the event in a series of documentary videos that are spaced out along the river. So click on that and bring up old Charlie talking about the, the bison. So that is the, uh, the interactive river map. And that brings us to Explore the River. So this is where we'll get into the interactive modules, building uh, traditional fishing tools and virtually restoring a river. But I wanted to give you uh, that overview of Fire on the Land and the uh, Lower Flathead River interactive map because there are also resources that will be converted from Flash to the web. So here we're looking at the website. Um, Explore the River started as an interactive Flash DVD. Uh, but come January, it'll be available uh, for everybody on the web. And this is the home page. So we have here an introductory video to the entire project. Uh, and then we have the, the individual chapters. History, Habitat, Fish, Culture and History, A Century of Change, and Restoration. And each of those has an introductory video on that particular topic. So we can look at hydrology, for example, and see the introductory video, and then all of these subtopics under hydrology, the parts of a mountain stream, the attributes of a healthy stream, uh, a map where you can explore the Jocko watershed, uh, how hydrographs work, and then at the end of each chapter, we have a knowledge check. A short quiz that uh, takes maybe five minutes or so uh, for the students so you can check the students knowledge of the topic. The next chapter is habitats and uh, includes aquatic habitats for fish, the four C's, cold, clean, complex, and connected to four essential elements of a healthy stream uh, aquatic habitats for insects, repairing habitats, and a knowledge check. The next chapter is fish, and this includes uh, salmonid ana anatomy, where students can virtually dissect a fish. We have species profiles, where you can uh, look at the life histories and, and profile of I think 12 different species, both native and non-native species, found in the Jocko River. And life history of bull trout in detail, and then again, a knowledge check. And that brings us to culture and history, where we're going to spend uh, the next few minutes looking at how you virtually make traditional tools. But the culture and history uh, chapter also includes a gallery of traditional tools used by Salish and and Kootenai people. Includes a history of bull trout and the Salish and people, elder interviews, and a storybook called Bull Trout's Gift, and of course the knowledge check. 
So let's build some traditional fishing tools that were used by the Salish, Pondere, and Kootenai people. Uh, I put together a temporary website so that you can practice building the tools uh, or even use them with your students until the uh, official Explore the River website becomes active early next year. And so after this brief introduction down here are the interactive mod modules making a fish spear, a fish trap, a fish hook, and then virtually restoring a stream. The URL for this uh, website is temporarypost.org. Then click on one of these modules to practice. Uh, these take a while to load, so be patient, uh, depending on your internet speed. Some, if you have a fast speed, they'll load after probably five or ten seconds, but they may take as long as 30 seconds or so to load. So let's start by building a virtual fish spear. Before we get started, I want to explain how the page is set up. On the left side, up here on top, is a little box that talks about what we're going to do. So in this case, we're talking about removing bark from the pole and why we're doing it. Then underneath that, there's a specific instructions to tell the user exactly what they need to do. There are also instructions uh, or little prompts on the main part of the page. And finally, at the bottom of the page, there's a little breadcrumb trail that tells you exactly where you are in the process of building a fish spear. So let's get started. I'm going to grab the uh, the little stone flint tool and begin dragging it against the, uh, the lodge pole to peel the bark off the pole. And we'll just keep dragging until all the bark has been peeled from the pole. As soon as we finish, we can see a prompt comes up to tell us to go to the next page, which is peeling the fork. On this page, we're going to cut the fork right at the base. Now we have to drill a hole in our lodge pole so we can insert the fork. You'll notice on some of the pages there are illustrations and information about the tools that we're using. In this case, it's a a beaver tooth chisel and it talks about beaver teeth how they keep growing throughout the life of the beaver and how they're really strong and you can use them to to chisel wood with here we're chiseling the uh, hole a little bit larger so the fork will go in more easily So here we're going to tie the fork to the lodge pole, and we're going to do that just by clicking on the cord. Now we're going to drill some holes for the three bone points that go into the shaft and the fork. And we do that just by clicking on this piece of flint, uh, and it'll drill the holes.
Okay, now we're ready to make the bone points. And to do that, we're going to make them out of bone, but we have to break the bone first. Now we need to sharpen the, the bone pieces to make the points, and we do that by dragging it across this piece of sandstone. So that's the big point. Now we're going to make the two smaller points doing the same thing. On this part of the module, it's really important that you read this instruction up here. The point needs to be uh, dragged all the way across the rock. It, it's a little buggy if it's not drug uh, the full length of the rock. So you can tell your students that when they're, when they're working on this. Okay, now we're going to use a charcoal pitch mixture to paint the end of the bone points uh, so they'll stick into the shaft and be glued into it and into the fork. So we're done. There we have our fish spear. It's exactly like the real one that Tim Ryan built. And this is the final page. Congratulations. One other thing that I wanted to point out, we're looking at the uh, interactive DVD right now, but this is going to be true of the website as well. When you click on any of these, building or, or making cordage or line, building a fish trap, building a fish spear, or making a fish hook, first thing that comes up is this uh, video and of Tim Ryan making a, an actual fish spear. And there are a number of questions to get started, and then it goes into um, the actual construction of the spear. Once students have watched this video and they see someone making an actual fish spear, each of the steps, they can make their own virtual spear by clicking here. And that'll be set up in a similar way on the website once we get that built. Okay, so next we're going to build a fish trap. This is a little more involved than the building of fish spear. But we'll start here. Again, the instructions in the rationale are on the left-hand side, and in the little sage-colored box are the specific instructions. So here we're drying the uh, we're drying the willows by clicking on them. And then here we're going to make the hoops for the fish trap by pushing on the the uh, willow stick to make a, a circle and then we tie it off. We make three hoops, each one a little smaller than the previous one. Now we'll add the ribs to the hoops. First the bottom, then the top, and then we work down the side. Whoops. You'll see that if you drag the, the stick to the wrong place and let go of it, it just goes back to where it started.
Now we add the remaining ribs to the other side of the, of the trap by clicking on them. And this way they're all done at once. Then we tie off the, the ribs by clicking on the piece of cordage. There is a cone that sits inside the trap that the fish swim through and then can't swim back out of. So now we need to make the hoops for the inner cone. And we do that in the same way that we made the original uh, hoops, larger hoops. Then we move these uh, inner hoops into the trap and then we add the spikes that form the, the funnel that the fish can swim into but can't swim back out of. And again, the other half we do just with a single click. Now we tie it off. And we can view the trap in 3D. So that's making the fish trap. The last fishing tool that we'll make is a fish hook. Here we have a flint knife. We'll use it to cut a hawthorn branch to get one of the, one of the uh, spines or thorns off the hawthorn. And we take that thorn, blow it up so we can see it a little better, and we scrape the, uh, carefully scrape the bark off it. If you see the picture in the left hand side there, you can see Tim scraping the bark off a hawthorn, uh, hawthorn thorn. Now we need to make a split or a cut in the bottom of the thorn so we can tilt the thorn upwards. And we tie our fishing line to it. Then we use a stone to crush some, some charcoal from a fire and we melt pitch into that charcoal, mix it up, and that becomes our glue. We put some on a stick and paint the hook so that the, the line is protected. The cordage that's on there is protected from the water and the elements. And once it's all painted. We can see the hook being used in 3D with the grasshopper and a fish. And that's building a fish hook. And the last thing we're going to do is virtually restore a river. This is the last of the four interactive modules. You'll notice when we get to this page our cursor becomes an excavator. And what we're going to do is follow the flags with the excavator and dig a new stream channel. The channel on the right is the old stream and it's bounded by levees and all the meanders have pretty much been lost. We're going to build a new channel and put meanders back into it. So we'll just use the excavator to follow the flags and dig a new channel. The next step is to stabilize the banks of what will become the new uh, stream channel with wattles. 
wattles are uh, cylindrical bundles of plant fiber along with willow stakes, live willow stakes, that will sprout and grow once the stream has been restored. So you just drag and drop the wattles into the little trenches at each of the flagged locations. Each time one is dropped, a new flag location pops up. Once they've all been placed, the next step is to bury the wattles so they'll stay in place. Clicking Next brings us to this page. And this is an um, information page about uh, root wads and their value, how they work. So after the students finish reading this page, they'll go ahead and place root wads in the stream. And you do this the same way that we place the wattles. They're flagged locations with trenches for the tree uh, trunks. And so you just drag and drop them into place. they're all placed, we click the next button to bury the, the trunks of the trees. This is an information page two that talks about large woody debris jams. Now if the students learn about the large woody debris jams, they place them. The first step is to drag uh, these logs with roots attached onto the stream and they'll hold the, the bundles of large woody debris in place. And we have to bury the uh, trunks of the trees holding those. And then we drag the piles of debris, woody debris, onto those groups of, of logs and roots. The next step is to uh, put in the grade control structures. These are to prevent down cutting in the stream or erosion in the stream. And there are several different kinds, armored tailouts, uh, straight veins, J-hook veins, and cross veins. Um, and these are built from rocks and logs. So this is an information page describing grade control structures. Click Next and we will uh, start building them. Building these structures is pretty straightforward. You just follow the instructions on the page. So here we're setting down the logs and the rocks for a J-hook vein. And here we'll build a rock straight vein. Okay. Smaller rocks are footer rocks and these larger rocks go on the upstream side of those. Now we'll build a rock cross vein in the same way.
Again, these larger rocks go on the upstream uh, side of the foot of rocks. You notice a little locator map in the right-hand corner that shows your, uh, your stream channel and where you are at the, any given moment. Okay, now we're going to build a log straight vein. We're finished building our structures now, so by clicking the next button, we can divert the stream into this new channel that we've built. Now, by clicking the next button, we can reseed the area so it becomes revegetated. And we can drag and drop shrubs and trees onto the floodplain. and then we can watch these things grow. Now, when we click the next button, we can take a virtual tour of our uh, re restored or reconstructed stream. So we start out in the uh, lower part of the stream where we built our log J-hook. By clicking next structure, we can move on and look at the rock straight vein that we built. And there's a little fish swimming in there. And here we see the rock cross vein. And here's the log straight vein. And a rock J hook vein. And here's some root root wad revetments and a large woody debris structure and here's a rock log cross vein so i should have mentioned below uh, at the bottom of the page for each of these structures is the description of the structure and how it's how it functions and what its purpose is so we've just restored a stream and taken a tour of it and it's a beautiful newly restored stream once again, you can practice these interactive modules uh, in between now and the time that we have the new website up. And so uh, the URL is temporarypost.org. Once the website is up with Fire on the Land, Explore the River, and the interactive river map, the Tribal Department of Education will let everybody know and will let you know how to find them on their website. And that's it. We've reached the end of our 50 minutes. And I want to thank everybody for attending. And I hope that you find the, the three online resources that are coming soon to the web useful. Most of all, I hope your students enjoy them and get a lot out of them. So thanks again, and we'll talk with you later.